Welcome to First Methodist Church. I am Pastor Will. I'm uh, delighted to be here to be back with you. I know it's been, uh, I was not here last Sunday for a general conference, but it's good to be back with you. Uh, welcome uh, to all of our, our guests and visitors. We are starting revival, not tonight. We're starting revival right now. Okay. And in fact, uh, I feel like for me, it's, it's been going on for a good week and a half uh, because it started in Costa Rica with our uh, Global Methodist Church uh, General Conference. Uh, so thank you for all your uh, God has been moving the Spirit has poured out on us, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to, to share a little bit about, about that with you uh, at a later date. Uh, certainly at the forefront of our minds this morning, we lift up our, our brothers and sisters and friends and family uh, in the western part of the state uh, that have been affected by this storm. Uh, we certainly pray for them, uh, but uh, and, and we say, well, we're, we're going to pray for you. That's that's not the least we can do. It's that, that's the most we can do. And in addition to that, uh, we're going to be collecting some items. Uh, we're going to be focusing some of our mission teams uh, this summer on the Appalachian Service Project to get up there and, and uh, help uh, with the long-term rebuild and all that stuff. So uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities to serve and, and to contribute to those to those efforts. Um, be on the lookout for, for a list of things that we're going to be collecting to, to take a load of things up there uh, as well. Uh, several announcements. In fact, we've got a whole list of announcements on the back of your, your bulletin there. Just, just be mindful of those. Children's ministry. Uh, this is not in the bulletin, but children's ministry. Please let Catherine know if you're going to be going on the Lazy Five trip next Sunday. She needs to, she's going to order the, the tickets this week, so let her know by today about that. Also, Mamas and Ministry is going to be meeting this Thursday here at Langford Hall at 6 p.m. Um, as I said about revival, remember, uh, this is not just a, a Sunday morning thing, but we're going to be worshiping tonight at 7 p.m. And revival this year, if you didn't know, is, is going to be here at Langford Hall. We're going to stay uh, down here. The band's going to be uh, playing. The choir's actually singing tonight. Uh, the band will be leading worship Monday night. And then Tuesday night, Matthew Weaver will be here to uh, to lead worship. So we've got three wonderful nights of, of worship, of revival. Uh, please make every effort to be here. It's a special season in the life of the church where we're just, we're just praying and we're, we're hoping with, uh, with anticipation for just a fresh outpouring of, the, of God's Spirit upon us. Uh, and we're so excited to have uh, Reverend Amy uh, uh, Lambert here. <laughs> As always, he's his number one favorite thing. <laughs> such a gift to, to the church, not just our church, but the church, and we're grateful to have you here. Uh, so because it is Revival Week, we're not going to have a wonderful Wednesday this week, so you're going to be at church tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night. We thought it was a little cruel and unusual to invite you back on Wednesday, so we're going to give you a break on Wednesday night, except for the choir. The choir uh, is going to be kicking off uh, practicing for the Christmas cantata. Uh, finance committee on Thursday, trustees next next week, administrative council next week. Um, you can read all the rest of it. We've got a fall festival coming up on October 26th, also a blood drive on October 27th. Uh, we continue to uh, collect funds for our new capital campaign, the Joyful Journeys. We're raising money for a uh, new bus and a new playground, so uh, we appreciate your gifts uh, for that. A lot of, as I said, many things going on in the life of the church. Most importantly, uh, please be here uh, tonight. 7 p.m. Monday night, Tuesday night, 7 p.m. All right here in, in Langford Hall. It's going to be a wonderful week of, of worship uh, and revival. Any other announcements? Anything I missed? Yeah, we, we got any prayer. Oh, I know it's Tammy's birthday today. Happy birthday, Tammy. Yeah. Any other birthdays and anniversaries in the house this morning? Megan and I celebrated our anniversary while I was in Costa Rica. So, uh, <laughs> that's a, both a praise and a prayer. <laughs>
Uh, God, be with Andy as he brings a, a word today. Lord, especially we lift up those that are hurting across our state and, and region from this storm. We pray for your peace. We pray for your uh, providence. Lord, that you would uh, make a way for those that have lost so much. Uh, Lord, we lift them up. Lord, we carry them in our hearts this morning as we worship you. So come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful this morning. Rekindle in us the fire of your love, we pray in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand as you're able to worship. <laughs> Praise the mountain. I praise the 
one by their kids down for two weeks. Lord, we're thankful for 
this family of faith that we can come together and, and worship you. Uh, Lord, we come with many things on our hearts this morning. And God, we know it, and we rest assured that as we reach out to you this morning, Lord, you're already reaching out to us. And so we're, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for your presence in our life. God, mold us into your people. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Lord, help us to be uh, your disciples, to put you first, to seek you first. God, for the, those that are hurting, those that are sick, Lord, pour out your healing touch upon them. God, we pray that you would strengthen our church. Lord, we pray again for revival uh, among us in our church, Lord, that it might begin in our hearts, and Lord, that it would spread, spread through our community and, and through our state and, and to our nation and to our world. God, strengthen us. Pour out your spirit upon us. We pray for our, our country, for our leaders, for all those who put themselves in harm's way for our protection, for all those who are out serving and and uh, for, our, for our linemen that are trying to restore power for our, our, uh, our rescue personnel that are, that are out rescuing people that are, that are stranded, Lord, uh, Lord, watch over them. Give them your strength. God, for the message that you've given Andy uh, today, Lord, I pray for just a special anointing over him as he comes to bring a word from you. Uh, Lord, in all things, we are grateful. And we just... Uh, Lord, what else could we say but uh, thank you? You are good. Uh, and Lord, we worship you this day. We ask all this in the name of Jesus who told us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Andy, uh, you come and bless us. Andy is, is no stranger to our congregation. He's a friend to, to many of us. Uh, he's a, a general evangelist of the, in the Global Methodist Church now. I'm just so excited for, for your ministry and what you bring, not just to our church, but the church. So, Andy, come and, come and bless us. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. Blessing, my brother. I was making my way to see you, and I didn't get a chance. I got to say, hey, brother, you doing all right? Hello, hello. Oh, church family, I am thrilled to be here, and I, I am beginning to feel like family. I get, I've got to, to be here at this church and with them at Camp Tacoa, and I was with you for the big youth rally that your church sponsored. If you are a youth that was a part of that, will you just wave your hand there? I, I have shared the testimony of, of how God laid that on your heart, just a handful of you, and you walked in faithfulness, and God blessed it, and it was really an amazing event. And I've been watching online your pastor represent the church uh, in Costa Rica, and I don't know if you've been able to see a little bit of it online, but the Holy Spirit moved in might and power in that place. And, and uh, so I'm so thankful. For the servants who win, I'm a little jealous. Uh, I really am. As I watched online, I could just see uh, the Holy Spirit moving in my power, and I would have loved to have been there in person. But I'm so thankful um, for those faithful servants uh, who win, and uh, we're going to see echoes uh, of what the God is doing uh, across this world. Uh, revival is coming. If you grab your Bibles or your Bible apps, or if you just want to sit and listen, I'm going to share a word of Scripture with you this morning. And from the book of Genesis, in the third chapter, I'm going to begin reading at the first verse. This is a story that you may have heard. Open your ears this morning and hear it anew. Step out in faith and believe that from this ancient book, God is still speaking. And that he has a word for your life and my life this morning. Genesis 3, 1 says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. 
You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Holy Spirit, you are moving in this place. Open our hearts to what you would say to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I want to tell you a story this morning. And I do some storytelling. Uh, but this one is based uh, with just a little bit of a, a, a true thing that happened in my life. But just a little bit. The rest is greatly exaggerated. <laughs> the title of this story is, There are two things worse than coming across a live snake. My name is Avery Percival Usetter. I'm Margaret Allison Garland Usetter's boy. Y'all know the people just live across the highway over there. We so far out in the country, you had to ride a pregnant horse into town so you'd have a fresh one to ride back on. <laughs> Granny Usetter didn't like snakes. Now, now, a few people do, but, but she really didn't like snakes. And any time there was a snake that come around, uh, she'd want Grandpa to kill it. And Grandpa, he'd say, now, Granny, that's a black snake. And that's going to kill mice and rats and copperheads. And Granny would always say, I don't care if it's a purple polka dotted snake. I want you to send it to snake heaven. <laughs> and, and we had a, 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 a thing that would dispose of snakes. It was a garden hoe. Now, when I was a young if you'd asked me, what's a garden hoe for? I wouldn't have said for getting weeds out of your garden. I'd have said it's for snake killing, because that's all I'd ever seen. Now, Granny was so scared of snakes. But if there was a snake around, and Grandpa wasn't around, and one of the youngest wasn't around, she'd handle it herself. Even if she was terrified, she'd handle it herself. And so we was walking out on the farm one day, me and Granny, and, and I found something on the ground, and I held it up there, and I said, Granny, what is this? And it was the skin of the, the, the snake had shed. And she shuddered just a little bit. And she said, you know what that means? There's one around here. So there's something worse than coming across a snake. And that's coming across a snake skin because you know the snake's around. You just don't know where. <laughs> there's actually two things worse than that. But anyway, so she said, look, start looking. we got to find that snake. And sure enough, we found it. And, uh, did you hear my voice do that? <laughs> hey, from Green Acres. <laughs> sure enough, we seen that snake. And, and Granny said, I'm going to watch you. You go get the snake killer. Now, that, that's what she called it, the snake killer. Now, we renamed it, but I'll tell you that at the end of the story. So anyway, I went running as fast as I could, and I grabbed that garden home, and I come out, and I, I give it to Granny. And as scared as she was, she started chopping. And that snake lost its mind. Head went one way, body went the other way. Now, um, have you ever heard the phrase, uh, a chicken with his head cut off, running around like a chicken with it? I've never seen that. I've never seen that in my life. But I saw a snake move without its head. So Granny's sitting there talking to me about how, how, how stay away from snakes, don't you be playing with snakes. And that snake slithered toward Granny without its head and wrapped its body around its ankle. Well, Granny started dancing like she was a, a Pentecostal. <laughs> she started cussing like she was Episcopalian. <laughs> said, did God really say that? And after she read that to me, I said, Granny, how many times have you read the Bible? She scratched her head and she said, well, not enough. And I said, Granny, you've been reading the Bible all your life. You've been going to church. You've been praying. You've been doing mission work. Don't you think you know it by now? And she said to me, this old world will lie to you. And we align ourselves. And so, you got to have a handle on the truth. So I keep reading the Bible, so I keep remembering what's true. 
The next day, I asked Grandpa if he'd help me. And we carved the truth into the handle of that garden on And we renamed it. Because I wanted to remember, if you got to face a lie, you better have a handle on the truth. <clears throat> the serpent in this story, we never hear from again, not in that form. But the lie that that serpent told keeps slithering back into our lives. So what do we do with the lies that won't die? we got to know the truth. When I was in uh, 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 college, uh, my, my college roommate, one of my college roommates' father was a Vietnam War veteran. And he had been captured and held for uh, as long as many of soldiers had been held. And he shared with us some of the things they did to torture him. And they, they, you know, beat him and they left him without food and they put him in tiny cages. But he said the worst was the psychological torture. They would read things to him and say it was from the U.S. government and say that they'd given up on him and that he should just surrender. And, and uh, he, he didn't know what was true. And, and tell him that they weren't going to try to rescue him. There's no use for him to try to escape, that this country hated him. And he just didn't know. Is this true? Is this not true? He said, but there came a moment when they read a letter and said, this is from your wife. She has divorced you. She doesn't love you. And she never loved you. And he said something clicked in his head because he knew that at some time his wife had loved him. And once he knew the truth, he couldn't fall for any lie. We, we as, as believers are called to, to dig into the Word. And John Wesley called himself a man of, of one book. That didn't mean he didn't read other books. He, he read all kinds of books. But his life was shaped by the Scriptures. And, and St. Ignatius said it this way, Ignorance of, of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. We're called to know this Word. And, and uh, I, I, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. I remember what my Greek professor said to me in my first semester. Andy, would you like to drop this class? I said, I <laughs> <through."> I said <laughs> And I did. I dropped that class. Well, we just got to know it better today than we knew it yesterday. We got to fall back in love and take a new look at this old book. There is, there's life in here. There, there is the knowledge of, of Christ in here. You, you, can, you can know the Scriptures and not know Christ. I, you know, I, I had some of those in seminary. You can know the Scriptures and not know Christ. But you cannot know Christ without the Scriptures. Fully know Him. Fully know His love for you, His depth of love for you, and, it, and, and the image He has for you and the life that He has for you. I want to give you something as practical as I can this morning. Martin Luther, who's the father of a Protestant Reformation, was getting his hair cut. And if you've ever seen a drawing of Martin Luther, his barber had something against him. I mean, he's bad at it. And, then, uh, you know, remember the bowl haircut? They just put a bowl on kids' heads and snip it around. This was the opposite. It was like they, they, they put a bowl and cut everything above on the bowl there. That's what he looked like. So, um, on purpose, you know what he was doing. And, uh, but his barber said to him, how can I understand the Bible? And Martin Luther took four strands of Scripture, about four strands of hair, and twisted each strand, and then twisted the four together. And he said, every Bible verse that you read, look at it and ask, what does this teach me about God? About who He is? What does this teach me about myself? Where does this lead me to repentance? And how should I live differently? <clears throat> and so I hope that's something you and I can take home. And every time we read the Bible, every time we dig in to, to know who Jesus is, to know who we are, to, to lead us to real and genuine repentance, and then to lead a different life. The Bible is not meant just to inform, but to transform. And our lives ought to be different. <laughs> when we encounter So take every chance you can to, to, to read the Bible. Uh, if you're new to it, I, I, I suggest begin in Leviticus. I made that up. Don't begin in Leviticus. It's a terrible place. Maybe 1 John. 
would be a great place. But, and, and when I was a kid, I used to feel so guilty that I couldn't sit still and, and read, you know, three or four chapters. And uh, I got over that. You, you, you just need a couple of verses and let it, let it, let it ring in your heart. And, and, there's, and you may not know that there's purpose today, but someday you're going to encounter something. And that word that's been planted in your heart, it'll, it'll make a difference. I got some friends of mine, and, and their daughter is, was dating a fellow. And, uh, and they could tell she was in love. But they hadn't met him yet. She lived out of town. So they did some good old-fashioned stalking. It was awesome. I was there with them. Googling that boy's name. Finding out everything they could about him. They wanted to know the boy that loved their daughter. Fall back in love with the Savior who never fell out of love with you. See his face. Face. Hear his voice. The second lie. Second lie is you will become like God. I think that is the summation of the human experience. If you want to know the, the sinfulness of, of, of others than yourself, that one line, you will be like God. We want to be like God. That is, we want to be in charge of our lives. We, we, want, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We want to determine what we're going to do. Now, um, if, if I were to bring uh, tonight a golden image of a calf and, and put it on the altar here and say, you, I, I'd like each of you to come and bow down to this golden image. I bet there's not a person in here that would even be tempted to do that. But the old serpent's gotten smarter. And there's more than one way to bow down. And anything that takes greater priority than your relationship to Jesus Christ and your witness and love and service to Him, anything has become an idol. And the worst idol of our culture is the worship of self. Of, you know, you do you and I'll do me. You know, I, I'm just going to follow my heart. No more misery has been caused in people's lives and families' lives than people following their heart. Because the Scriptures call us not to follow our heart, but to follow His. And to walk in His footsteps. I think probably the greatest weapon we have is mission. To get plugged into the life of the church. Now I know that's something a preacher ought to say. But there's something about making an impact in the life of others in Jesus' name. That reminds us of the great truth. We are not God. He is. And we would make a terrible God. Begin to serve Him. The last line. You will not die. And our culture and our age and, and every age does everything that we can to not think about our own mortality. To not think about that life is short and fragile. But then life interrupts us and we're reminded again. Two weeks ago yesterday, I was working on the sermon that I was going to preach the next day. And a friend of mine who we've been contacting all through the day, they were having their first grandchild. And we've been, you know, I asked him, what do you want them to call you? You want Papa, <laughs> Grandpa, Gramps? And at 10, 10, I got a call, uh, a text. And it said, please pray. Things aren't looking good for Sarah. That's their daughter. And at 10.30 on Saturday night, two weeks ago, I got a text. Our sweet daughter is going to heaven. You don't hear about it as much. A woman dying in childbirth. The baby's okay. And they, along with the dad, are going to be raising that baby. And I hadn't thought about death all day long. I was reminded that none of us are promised tomorrow. 
and that life is short. And for the believer, that knowledge that life is short, that life is fragile, is not so that we can wallow in death, so that we can be blessed in life, so that we can have an urgency again about what life is about. I set my alarm clock wrong this morning. I did. I was supposed to set it for uh, 6 a.m. so that I could leave the house about, about 7.20. And I said it, I don't know how, at 7 a.m. And I woke up and I looked and I thought, I don't have time to do all the things I had planned to do this morning. I don't have time to get me an egg biscuit. I don't have time to get me a cup of coffee. i got to get ready to go see Will. <laughs> when we realize that life is short, we reprioritize. When we realize, we reprioritize what our life is to be about. Life is short. Call your mama. <laughs> life is short. Take your wife out on a date. Life is short. Tell your children what Jesus means to you. Life is short. Tell your grandchildren how you came to know Jesus. Life is brief and short and fragile. Live for Him. And then we have seasons. How long we're on this earth? We have seasons. And can I say that um, either He's going to come back and we're going to see Him or we're going to uh, uh, go see Him. The, the early church felt the urgency. They believed that Jesus was coming back at any time and they lived like that. Now throughout history, Christians have made the mistake of trying to predict it. Some of you have lived through the time. I can remember uh, in 1988, 88 reasons Jesus is coming back in 88. He didn't come back in 88. So many people have gotten it wrong by predicting some date, but many people have gotten it right by living with the urgency. Either He's coming to us or we're going to Him. And in that urgency, there are seasons, moments. Right now, we live in a season that we get to help people in Western North Carolina who lost everything. And in years to come, they'll be recovered. But that moment that we can help them, that's going to pass. My grandson is 10 years old. He'll be 11, 12, 13, 14. There's a moment in time that I get to love him, be a witness to him. And that season's going to go away. So we want to live for Jesus right now. Not another day, not another moment that our lives aren't about him, about his love for us, that we, that we don't put him on the throne that he deserves and take ourselves off, that we don't begin to know that, that, that he is the God who loves us. <coughs> There's one more unspoken line, and that is the belief that Adam and Eve could never again be reunited with the Lord whom they had rejected. And the cross of Jesus Christ is a reminder that in our brokenness, in our lostness, Jesus has not fallen out of love with you. On your worst day, when you committed your worst sin, when you feel the worst about yourself, He still loves you madly and deeply. He has not given up on you. And this day, this moment, He is calling you to renew your faith in Him. We're going to sing a closing hymn in just a second. And I, I'm going to do that thing you never think a, a traveling evangelist is going to do. I'm going to invite you to come pray at the altar of this church. Woo! He really does come up with new things. I invented that. A lot of people don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not calling for old-timey religion or nostalgia or anything like that. But there's something about getting on our knees that, that physically says, I'm not God. You are. I need you. My family needs you. Our nation needs you. This world needs you. So I'm going to invite you as a church to begin to pray that God would pour out His Holy Spirit upon these next few days of revival. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but because He loves us and our hearts are open. And maybe this morning uh, has nothing to do with what's going on in your life. You're struggling with something else. There is a God who is ready to answer your prayers. He is still in the miracle business. Like one more. Uh, I was in a, 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 a Beyond Seminary uh, study.
study group, and we were studying the fishes and loaves. And uh, 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 there was a person in there who said, uh, I don't think it was miraculous. I think the boys shared the fishes and loaves, and that caused everybody else to, sh to serve the fishes and loaves. And I love that idea. If that's what the Bible said, that's a beautiful story. But as I looked at it, I don't think that's what I said. Now, I might be wrong. I absolutely might be wrong about that. I absolutely might be wrong. But um, it, it's, what I want to know is the reason why. If, if you can't believe in a miracle, that's different than saying God did a miracle in a different way. And so, there's still people whispering in our ear, did God really say that? Is he still a God of miracles? Yeah. He really said that. Is he still madly and deeply in love with you? Yeah, the Bible really says that. Is he calling you to a new life? Yeah, he is. Let's pray together. Let's begin this series together in, in prayer. Uh, as we invite the musicians to come forward, uh, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand. We're going to be singing for just a moment. And as you feel led, will you come and pray? Pray for somebody in your family who's struggling. Let's come and pray for those who right now are, are putting up power lines and who are operating with chainsaws, who are bringing clean water and, and hope uh, to folks who have lost everything. Whatever the Lord leads you, let's, let's begin this time with uh, really seeking after God. Let's stand together. <laughs> Get up there. 